Wentz steps up. Here comes the rush. He is going deep, and it is caught. And in for a touchdown, Deshaun Jackson. Give the people what they want. I really like Jason Kelsey at this point in his career because there aren't many players who can just rip into an entire organization, but he has that ability right now, and, and he didn't hold back this week, and it was good to see. It was. It needed to be said. Um, there's not a lot of guys in this roster who can say the things that he said, and um, it was necessary. And uh, gosh, it's rare that you hear a player, an active player, call out the front office, the coaching staff, as well as his teammates. Um, it needed to be said. I'm glad he said it. Uh, and it's all accurate. It's all true. And I think as bad as Carson has been, um, as bad as everybody's been, this is a this is a team effort. You don't get to the point the Eagles are at without contributions from every level, and, and that's what we're seeing. This is the Eagle Eye Podcast presented by Nissan with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. We'll dive a little deeper into what Kelsey had to say. We'll talk about Jalen Hurts. Ray Dittinger will join us shortly to talk a little bit more about Hurts and Carson Wentz and that dynamic. Uh, Malcolm Jenkins is coming back to town this weekend. We'll talk about him a little bit and what happened there. And also Jason Peters and Alshon Jeffrey, are they going to play Sunday? We'll, we'll kind of figure out that situation. Gosh, I as, hope so. As well. Uh, but I think we should start and continue with Jason Kelsey because, yeah, it was – he look, because Carson Wentz gets benched and probably deserving of getting benched. He hasn't played well. But Kelsey brought up the point that, yeah, sure, he's the guy that gets benched, but it's everyone. It really is everyone, everyone on that offense, everyone in the, in the coaching staff, in the front office. It, you really – it's a group effort to be this bad. Yeah, and, and I think it starts at the top, and I, I think we all have that. And now I'm not absolving Carson. Uh, I, I, he has not played well. Um, and even with what he's been given, he hasn't played well. But it's all got to be in context. And, um, I mean, how he has failed, has failed Carson, how he has failed his team. Um, the lack of, of talent is, is glaring, and the lack of young talent in particular is shocking. The lack of offensive talent, and, yes, they've had injuries on O-line. Every team has injuries. Um, and, you know, we talk about the O-line and, well, they lost Dillard and they had Milano. Milano might be better than Dillard right now anyway. So it's kind of like a specious argument there. Obviously, they missed Brandon Brooks. JP was a disaster. Uh, but, you know, and you Lane. Have they're missing of, Lane. They certainly miss Lane. Uh, I do think Driscoll's an upgrade over Pryor. Um, but um, it, that, that said, I, I mean – I think it starts with Howie. I think Doug's been terrible and the receivers have been, have been terrible or poor to terrible. Um, and they're not the receivers the Eagles should have. I don't, I don't really blame a guy like Rager. I think he's done what he can with a slumping quarterback and a bad coach and bad play calling and injuries. Uh, but top to bottom, Howie's failed the team. Doug has failed the team and the players have failed the team. And it's a, it's a perfect storm. And, you know, people are like, well, how would you assess blame percentage-wise? You know, I, I don't even know. It all overlaps. It all kind of works together. Um, it's just an organization-wide failure. And to get from where they were to where they are now – but we kind of – you know, you can kind of see it coming. I mean, with the, you keep piling up bad draft after bad draft. You're just going to stop winning games, and that's what's happened. Yeah, and I think the frustrating thing is not that Howie hasn't identified and said, hey, we need to get – players on offense, but he's just gotten the wrong ones, you know? I mean, Andre Dillard in the first round, that's great. You're getting a, a your next left tackle, and then we'll see. I mean, um, his rookie year wasn't great. He didn't play a ton, and then he gets hurt, so we'll see on that one. But you draft J.J. You draft Jalen Rager, and we'll see about Jalen Rager too. But um, instead of getting high-impact players, he got guys who aren't helping right now. And then the – the one guy he gets recently that looks like he can really help is Miles Sanders. And then Doug doesn't use him well. So yeah, it, it, it does overlap with all this stuff. And my favorite part about what Kelsey said was that he said it without absolving Carson Wentz because so much of the conversation 
in the last few weeks has been like, either it's Carson's fault or it's not Carson's fault. And it's like, you, you mentioned that the defense hasn't gotten interceptions and everything. There's the Carson backers go, Oh, I guess Carson isn't picking off the ball. And you can do that with anything. You really can, but Carson hasn't played well. And the fact of the matter is that in a situation like this, where you're lacking talent offensively, where everything is disjointed, you really rely on your franchise quarterback to cover up a lot of that crap. And the fact that he hasn't would be one thing. The fact that he's adding to it is another. And and that's really why I think they had to pull the trigger here. He's not helping the team. He's not helping himself. It was the right decision. I, I we both agree on that. It was a decision they had to make. Um, but I, I appreciate Jason Kelsey putting it in, into context for everyone. And it's, it's something that really, like, how many guys on the team can really do that? I mean, maybe BG, but it's not really his nature. He's such a positive guy. I mean, not that Jason was being negative. He's just being honest. But it's not really in BG's nature to, to, to do that. And um, he's really speaking about offensive matters. Yeah, I mean, I guess true. Jason Peters could, but we haven't talked to him in, in years. <laughs> yeah. In a year. We haven't talked to Jason Peters in a year. Um, but, yeah, not much has happened since we talked to you, Jason. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, um, yeah, it was interesting that Jason didn't mention the defense, and I think the defense has been okay um, for the most part. They've been all right. Um, I don't think they're the, the root of the problem. I know if, if the Eagles had scored they, – they averaged 28 points a game in 2017. If they scored 20 po- 28 points every game this year, what are the Eagles? Uh, nine and three, eight and eight and four, but yeah, three um, games. Yeah, so um, I don't against think three that, really good teams, they've given up thirty. Right? It's the Ravens, Steelers, and uh, and Packers. They've given up yeah, thirty. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And um, yeah, three MVP quarterbacks. Um, so sorry. I, I, it's inter. I, I wonder what the fallout will be. There's really not much anybody can say. I mean, I'm sure if, if we had a chance to ask Howie, we won't talk to Howie till after the season. You know, what did you think of Jason's comments? I mean, what can he say? And say, well, he's right. You know, we've none of us have done as well as we could do. And um, I, I think you're so right that there's such a tendency to want to blame one person. And you know, it's not it's not Carson. It's Doug. It, you know, it's it's not it's not Doug. It's Howie. It's everybody. And I think one thing about playing Hertz is that we'll see. It's kind of like a control experiment, you know, where you change the variables. And, I mean, if, if all of a sudden the wide receivers start making a lot more plays, then, you know, you, 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 and they, they did in a small sample size Sunday, then, then you start to kind of say, well, maybe at least the, the receivers are functional. Or, you know, maybe – I think you can learn, you can learn a lot from – you know, if all of a sudden the, the pass pro is better, um, you know, you, you learn stuff that way. But, yeah. but, but also it's not a control experiment. And we have to remember that too, because so many of the other variables are changing. You know, Doug, Doug might run the offense differently. The Jalen Hurts has a different skill set that's going to make certain aspects look better um, naturally, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's changing that problem. You know what I mean? If, if Jalen Hurts scrambles away from the pocket, it doesn't mean the protection was any better. It just means that skill set is covering up that problem. Um, so I, I think that you're right. There's some value in it. And if Jalen Hurts plays really well, the Doug Peterson might go, hey, look, look at my offense with a different quarterback. Yeah, um, I, I think that's there. But I also think the Eagles have to be really honest and not get fooled by it too because it, it isn't completely controlled. What do you think Jeff Lurie thinks of Kelsey's comments? I think he probably agrees. I mean, I, I feel like it almost – I mean, not that he would have any trouble if, if he wanted to make a move, but, uh, you know, a, a coaching change. But when somebody like Jason Kelsey says all that, it almost kind of – you know, it's one thing for media and fans to say it, you know. For, for the – one of the greatest players in Eagles history to say it, um, really kind of validates everything everyone else has said and thought and I think kind of almost empowers an owner to, you know, really feel that anything is in play. I, I don't think Jeffrey Lurie would have hesitated, but, you know, I think when, when a star player, three-time All-Pro, uh, you know, 
says stuff like that, it, it, it really does um, add credence to, to the whole notion that, you know, that things are falling apart. Yeah. And I, I give him credit for saying it. Um, it, it, it's, it takes guts to do it, but I feel like he's at the point in his career where why would he care? I mean, he's, it's a crap. yeah, he, he really doesn't good for him. Um, we're not going to talk too much about Jalen Hurts right now because we have Ray coming on soon, but I do want to just talk about his press conference the other day. Uh, he's not going to give us much in those. And I kind of, I kind of see his personality. He's just like a real laid back dude. Um, and I'm okay with him not giving us a lot in the press conference. That doesn't bother me any. Um, but I think you do get a sense of his kind of calm, quiet, confident demeanor from those. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's genuine. I mean, I don't think he's hiding anything from us. Like Carson, you kind of, he, he just kind of, he's very guarded. And I, I don't get the sense that Jay, that Jalen is guarded. He, I, I just get the sense that he's just this chill dude who just loves to play football. Um, it's interesting to hear him talk about the young receivers, you know, especially Rager and Ward. I mean, they're all very, very close. Um, I don't think Carson's not close with them, um, but it's certainly, you know, they're all kind of the same age. Um, actually, Greg Ward's probably closer in age to Carson than, than Jalen. <laughs> I think he's three, he years, is, yeah. three years older, two years younger. But, but it does seem like, you know, there's maybe a connection there um, personally. Um, you know, I mean, Ward – Ward was a quarterback, and I mean they they they've been in touch. They followed each other even before Hertz came here. They've known each other, so um, I don't know if that translates into performance. I I don't really think it does, but it's interesting to note. Um, you know, I, I think his natural leadership, very very natural, shines through. I mean, guys respect. I think um, was it was it Rager who said to, the guy won a national championship when he was 19. I mean, so you want a leader, you want a winner. I mean, just look what he did as a freshman, a true freshman in college. Um, so they. Young quarterback when, when Randall was young quarterback, the young receivers gravitated to him and, you know, cause the, he was like a superstar. He was like a rock star. And, and I think, I think you're seeing kind of the same thing a little bit. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I it was funny, you know. He he was actually asked about it, but he wore his Houston Astros gear. Uh, but to me, that it almost like exemplifies w what he is. He's going to be himself. He's you know he's he wanted to rep his hometown. He's gonna he's gotten to this point by doing the things he does, and I think that's really important for him to not change that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think I'd rather see him wearing Astros gear than disingenuously wearing like a Kyle Kendrick jersey or something and saying, hey, look at me, I'm a Philly guy now, you know, um, just be yourself. And, um, you know, the whole Astros thing and the whole cheating, you know, kind of pisses me off. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's his team. Uh, it's cool. Um, I was like, you know, Cesar Cedeno, my favorite Astro, Mike Scott. But, anyway, um, I, I don't mind it. Um, he seems very genuine and, um, uh, and he said some interesting things when we talked to him, um, very passionate guy, um, uh, just loves playing ball. Um, the, the contrast between him and Carson are, are crazy. I, I'm really kind of fascinated by their relationship. You know, we're so used to the, all the quarterbacks being so close here and everyone's always talking about the room and, you know, Nick and Carson and Nick and Nate, um, chasing Sam. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but you know, you don't, you don't, you don't get that from these two guys. And, and I don't think Carson's going to hold back helping them. And, and Jalen said he, he doesn't think that'll be a problem, but whenever we ask Carson about Jalen, he talks about how it's been a really difficult off season and guys didn't really get a chance to know each other. And um, you know, and when, when we asked Jalen about Carson, he, I, I think he said like five words about him and then changed the subject. And I don't think there's, any ill will or hard feelings there. I just don't think they're real close. Yeah. And that's okay. Um, it, it's just like, you know, in some people don't mesh as well, you know, you and I hate each other when we're not doing this podcast and it's just, we get by and we, we let's say hate. We, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I, I think there's, you know, it's, they don't have to be best friends. And um, in the last few years, the quarterback room has been like that. And that's great too. But 
they don't have to be. And as long as it's a professional relationship and it never becomes resentful and you can understand how it would, I mean, it's, I mean, that would be a natural progression. It wouldn't be a good one. It wouldn't be productive, but it would be natural on some level. Uh, you have to guard against that. And it seems like they're at least trying to guard against that. Yeah. And, and knowing Carson, and it looks like he'll be the number two. It sounds like he'll be the number two Sunday. Um, He'll Which play. I wouldn't have, by the way. I'd sit him. If you're yeah. going to bench him, bench him. I, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. I, I, I kind of thought Doug might do that. And he still might. We don't know that. We'll find out, okay, I guess, Friday or, or Sunday. At- Nate Sutfeld has got to be sitting there like, what the heck do I have to do? <laughs> Dress <laughs> on game day. 50-year-old guy. <laughs> yeah. 20-year-old guy. <laughs> um, but uh, – Fletcher, Fletcher was pretty funny. He's like, you know, hey, we'd be behind any quarterback, even freaking, when you say even freaking Nate Sutton. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think that Carson, no, Carson, when he has that clipboard, he's going to do all he can to, you know, to make sure Jalen has success. I, I'm sure it's not easy, but that, that's who he is. Yeah, he's a classy guy, and, and uh, I think we'll see that from him. Hey, tis the season to thrill at the Nissan year-end sales event. Get in and then get out and experience the most riveting ride of the year in a brand new Nissan. The savings on Nissan's lineup are sure to raise your pulse. Joining us now on the Eagle Eye podcast, as he does every week, our good friend Ray Didinger. Ray, how you doing? I'm good, David. How are you doing? We're doing well. This is our first chance to talk to you since the Packers game and we saw Jalen Hurts. And now, since Doug Peterson named him the starting quarterback for this coming week, to start there what was your reaction to that news um sort of what i expected i, I thought uh, when we were doing the post game show it's, it, it was interesting on in the post game show that um michael michael barkhand went around went around the group there and just asked everybody okay who, who's the quarterback next week uh, and barrett said he thought it was going to be wentz uh and uh and seth said if we're up to him he would play hurts but he thought it would be Wentz. Um, and I never thought for a second that it would be Wentz. I, I just thought that given the way the season had played out and the way the team looked in the first half of that game, um, I just felt that I, I just felt that they were going to give Hurts a try. I mean, the, the difference in the team was so obvious. Um, you know, we used the term, he gave them life, he gave them a spark. He did. Uh, and he didn't play, he wasn't perfect. Uh, but he definitely brought some life to the team. That uh, And he did some things that we hadn't seen Carson Wentz do in a very long time. So I thought it made perfect sense at this point to go to the kid and give him a chance to play and see what he can do. I fully expected it. Now now we get to see him play on Sunday. The problem is the challenge that he faces because he's going up against a New Orleans Saints defense that's really good. You mentioned that he, him doing things that we haven't seen Carson do. Obviously, he got down, the ball down the field uh, a couple times to, to Greg Ward for the touchdown and to Rager for the 34-yard gain. They were, they were both nice passes. What, what are some of the things you saw him do? What is, you know, when you talk about a spark, what did you see kind of in particular that, that created that spark? Um, the, first, the first thing, I don't know. I'm trying to think what would be the best way to describe it. But the thing that jumped out at me, more than, more than the stats, because 5 for 12 certainly isn't spectacular, but – um, it was just that he was so much quicker, uh, which isn't that surprising because we all know that that's, that's kind of his stock and trade as a running quarterback. But, but it, wasn't just a, it wasn't just a foot quickness. It was a mental quickness. It was, it was a decisiveness. Uh, and really, when you look at him in the pocket, his um, awareness of what was happening around him, you know, when the pocket was beginning to collapse, when he had to move, where he had to where where he had to go to find some space, create some space. Um, I mean, he had um, just a feel for what was happening around him that was so much sharper and so much quicker than what we had seen from Carson, which is really kind of the opposite of what you would expect. You would ex- you wouldn't expect the rookie to seem more aware of his surroundings and the situation on the field than the veteran, but um, you saw that right away. I mean, especially. I mean, there were a couple of little scramble plays where he took what could have been a negative play and turned it into some running yardage, which that in itself, okay, uh, you would have expected that he could do that because he has those kinds of skills. We've seen that in college. But the play that really was impressive was the touchdown pass to Ward, where he's under pressure, 
He gets out of trouble. He gets to the outside, keeps his eyes down the field, finds Ward and throws a perfect pass. I mean, that was, boy, I mean, we haven't seen that kind of thing out of Carson Wentz in a real long time. I guess maybe the pass to Scott that won the Giants game was that kind of thing. But other than that, I mean, we hadn't really seen Carson make that kind of a play in a long time. And when Ward made that one, I think to me that was the one that, I mean, that was that, that was one where you don't even think about going back to Wentz. At that point, you just got to ride the kid and see what he can do, see if he can build on that. Because that was, that really was an impressive play. Yeah, those were the same things we kind of talked about right after the game, Ruben and I, because that pocket presence from Wentz just hasn't been there. And that was something he was always really good at. Right. And it was pretty clear Hurts figured that out. Like you said, though, the Saints have a pretty tough defense – if you're Doug Peterson in this game, what do you do? I mean, how do you try to help out your rookie quarterback making his first start going against that defense? Well, I think you, I think you start by telling him that, you know, you're not asking him to go out and win the game, that uh, just kind of run the offense. And one of the things that I actually think might be beneficial to the team uh, is knowing, knowing Hurts and knowing where he is and knowing what his skills are right now. I really don't think – I feel like we're going down this dangerous road again talking about run pass, but I really can't imagine, given Hertz's his level of experience and the defense that he's going up against, that they're going to go into this with a game plan for him to throw the ball 45 times. I just don't see that. If Doug um, hears this, he's going to take this as a challenge, right? Yeah, please, please don't. Let's just keep this, let's just keep this among us, okay? But, but I think that just the – 26 for 59. <laughs> I, I just th- I just kind of think that the natural construct of this thing sort of tells me that um, that you're going to have to run the ball more. And uh, probably a lot of Hertz's plays will be RPO kinds of plays where the run game is built into it. Uh, and uh, I would expect that the, the, the switch to Hertz now almost in, almost demands that they're going to have to run the ball more. It almost demands that Miles Sanders is going to have to be a bigger part of the game just to take some of that pressure off the kid, number one, and number two, to set up the other plays that you're going to want him to make. So um, I think by making this change, they all, they're almost committing themselves to having to use Sanders more and to run the ball more and try and achieve a more balanced offense. You know, it's interesting. The Eagles' rushing numbers look good on paper. I mean, they're still – I think they're still fourth or third in the NFL in yards per carry, but they haven't run the ball well with the running backs during this four-game losing streak, at least not in the last three games. And it's interesting because I've always believed that, you know, you stick with it, even if it's not working, you stick with it, you stick with it. You saw that with Chubb. He wasn't doing anything. He got a big run at the end. You saw that with Aaron Jones. He, he got a huge run at the end and, and he right. wasn't, but Doug seems to get away from it. It seems like he always tries. It's not like I don't want to run the ball. He always tries early. <laughs> like miles had five carries in the first, in the first in drive. The first, in the first series. Right. But then if, but if he has like two carries in a row, you know, for one yard and two yards, then you don't see me again for the next five series. I think, I think it's imperative. I, I know he's going to try to establish a run early, but I think the big difference has to be that he sticks with it. Even if they're not getting four, five, six yards a pop, stick with it, keep doing it. You know, running backs will always tell you um, the, the more they play, the better feel they get for what the defense is doing. And that's why I see guys break long runs at the end of games because they're kind of drawing a bead on what the defense is doing. They feel comfortable. They, they, they know where the holes are going to be. And, and the great ones do that. Shady was great at that. You know, he, he might be 13 for 19 going into the third quarter, you know, going into the half, uh, second half. Next thing you know, he's, he's running 58 yards for a touchdown. And yeah, Doug just yeah. never gives his guy a chance to do that. I, I agree. I thought that, uh, I mean, there were a lot of, there were a lot of aspects to the, the, the Green Bay game that were, disappointing and hard to hard to sort of understand but one of them was kind of what you alluded to was on that first possession that first drive when they really kind of marched it right down the field against the Green Bay defense which we said going in wasn't particularly good against the run the Eagles certainly demonstrated that they drove it down there they got actually kicked the field goal got the lead and Miles had five rushing attempts on that drive and I think only had five for the rest of the game that's just that's just crazy stuff and especially when you have a back like Sanders who I who I think really has very special qualities uh, and is a home run hitter in his own right. I mean, he's not like a plodding back that maybe at his best is going to get maybe rip off a 15 yarder. I mean, he's got, the, I mean, this year he had back to back weeks, he had 74 yard runs. So, I mean, if, to keep feeding him the ball makes sense because 
he, but more than a lot of other backs in the league, have the ability that given that one crack, they're not just going to get your first down. They could take it to the house. You know, any carry, he could do that. He has that kind of ability. And the fact that for a team that has been so lacking in any kind of big play explosiveness, you know, to have this guy and not use him to me is – I mean, I've tried to put use him in the passing game, but frankly, he's had trouble catching the ball. But, okay, then just give it to him from scrimmage and let him try and, let him try and break one because I think you've seen – this year already, back-to-back weeks, he had big runs, and he's capable of that. So for a team that's been really sorely lacking any kind of explosiveness, I think he's one of the few players you can turn to, and not just early. I think you got to go to him for four quarters. And, you know, because of the, the, the rookie quarterback this week and the kind of quarterback that he is, I think they're almost going to have to do that. It would almost be infuriating this week if they stick with the run because of the rookie quarterback – and all of a sudden, you know, they, they run the ball 25 times and it really works because, I mean, we've been kind of saying that for, for months now that you have to stick with the run. It'll be interesting to see if this quarterback switch is the, the catalyst to that. And it might be, you're right. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of think they have to. I mean, I, I don't think they want to put Hurts in a position where they're going to ask him to throw the ball on every down. I mean, that would be just, just foolish. Uh, so they're going to have to – I mean, in the meetings this week, they're going to have to draw up a whole different kind of game plan for Jalen Hurts. They should. They have to. Uh, and, it, and, it, and, it may, and it may very well be, and I would expect it to be, a more scaled-down kind of ready list, a more scaled-down kind of game plan. Even if it's only, you know, even if it's only 15 to 20 plays, make them plays that he's comfortable with, make them plays that he can run, and make them plays that play to what you know his strengths to be. Um, you know, kind of – Sometimes when you're in a situation that the Eagles are right now, um, sometimes the best thing to do is just simplify stuff and, and get back to the basics and try and win play in that way. You know, I mean, rather than trying to expand and invent a whole new kinds of plays and do other kinds of stuff, just scale it down, play it to the strength of your players and see if that's going to work. I kind of expect it to be, you know, more of a minimalist kind of playlist to, you know, for the rookie quarterback. I think that would be the smart way to go. Right. If I can take you back to the draft, we never thought the Eagles were going to take Jalen Hurts. Uh, but what were your impressions of him as a prospect? Obviously, a, a well-known name. We, we'd all seen him at, at both stops. But what were your thoughts on him as a prospect in the draft? Um, well, like most people, I was really surprised when they made the pick. I, you know, I, I, just, I, I just really kind of couldn't believe it. It didn't seem to make much sense to me. Um, and, and, and it wasn't to say that I didn't think that Hertz was a player that didn't have any promise. I, he did. Uh, but I didn't see him as a guy that was a ready-made NFL player. I thought he was going to really have to develop his, particularly his passing game. The, his ability to run, you saw that. His ability to, to respond to pressure, he could do that. Uh, he was a guy that had a, a, a presence on the field that you could see his team, teammates rallied around him. Um, he made good decisions on the field. I mean, there's a lot that you liked with him. But I just didn't see him at this point uh, as a really pure, accurate passer. And um, the one thing that I thought was encouraging was in, in his going from Alabama to Oklahoma, uh, he really improved his passing greatly, I thought. In, in that one year, I thought his, his year at Oklahoma, he, he threw the ball with a lot more confidence. He threw the ball with a lot more accuracy that year than he did at Alabama. At Alabama, he really was purely, purely a runner. Um, in fact, I mean, I, I had some scouts describe him to me at that time as a running back who plays quarterback. Uh, well, they weren't saying that at Oklahoma. He had really improved as a quarterback. He had really improved his accuracy. So in terms of his passing, I thought he was trending in the right direction. But I still thought coming to the NFL that he was going to be a guy that was going to require some time to become a better, a better passer, a uh, more accurate passer to, uh, to take over and play and play a lot in the National Football League. And I kind of think that's still where he is right now. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it didn't, I, didn't, I didn't really understand the move to why the, you know, for a team that had as many needs as the Eagles had at that time, and we're now very aware of it when you look at the roster, uh, to go and draft a guy um, who maybe was, your, maybe was your quarterback down the road, maybe was going to be your backup quarterback, just seemed to me to be misguided. I mean, I, I, I had a lot of other guys in mind at that spot that I thought could have come in and helped this team right away. So the Hurts one, you know, forgetting even about the aspect of creating a quarterback controversy, that's another issue. Just the fact that you had so many needs to address there and could have addressed them 
and then you went out and got a second quarterback to me just seemed odd. Let me ask you this, Ray. Is there a danger in – I mean, he, you know, like him or not, I mean, he's a raw kid. Like you said, he, he's – you know, he's not coming to the NFL as a polished, you know, NFL quarterback. Well, you know, like some of the guys you see coming out, um, which isn't a knock on him. It's just, you know, that's where he is. Right. He hasn't played in a pro-style offense that long. Is there a danger in damaging him? In I mean, he's going out there and facing a, a team that's, you know, number two defense in the league, number one in, in, in yards, number two in points. Uh, is there a danger in, you know, either Sunday or over these next few weeks of doing long-term damage if it doesn't go well, if he struggles, you keep running him out there? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know him. I, don't know him. Um, I mean, everything you've heard about him, uh, at Alabama and at Oklahoma, indicated that he was um, mentally, mentally as well as physically tough. I mean that he, uh, I mean he went through what he went through at Alabama was, you know, you're talking about something that could break a guy's spirit. I mean, being pulled at halftime of the national championship game, uh, I mean that's pretty devastating. And he recovered from that. Um, and there, I've seen it work. I've seen it work both ways. I mean, I've seen guys get thrown in too soon in the NFL at that position, uh, and 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 really just never be the same. You know, I mean, it was. I mean, I I've always felt that I, I don't know how good David Carr could have been uh, as a player. I think he could have been really good. I mean, people now look back at him and say, "Oh, what a bust." I don't know. In a different situation with a better team and better coaching, I think he could have had a really good career. I think he's better than his brother. I thought as a college player, I thought he was better than his brother, but he just got put in a situation where, I mean, he, he never really had a chance. So that, that's the exact, that same, makes sense. the exact same concern about him. And he was the guy I was thinking of. He got sacked like 80 times. Hit, right. You know, the yep. first year, like 75 the second year. And he was just, and I mean, with this offensive line, you know, certainly that concern is there. I do think the decisiveness that Jalen showed Sunday in Green Bay will cut down the sacks. I know he was sacked three times in that game. I think it was for five yards. There were scrambles. They, it wasn't like he was in the pocket and the, and the line broke down and collapsed. It was the first extended playing time of his career. But there's still that concern. Um, oh, sure. I, I didn't think we'd ever get to this point. I'm sure the Eagles didn't either. But I just hope he's ready for what he's going to face. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very case-by-case -case kind of situation. I mean, I've seen young quarterbacks that – stand up to it. And even if they take their lumps, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't devastate them. I mean, I thought early this season, in fact, I think we even talked about it, the three of us, um, after we saw, well, even before and then after we saw Cincinnati and we saw Joe Burrow, um, who I think is, 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 is a very rare talent. I think he's, I think he's got real gifts. And we talked about the fact that, boy, they better put a team around him because with the, with the number of hits that he's taken and the beating that he's taken, um, I mean, he's still productive. He's making plays, but I just worry that they're going to get the kid really hurt and maybe you know, shorten his career, or maybe even end his career. And we kind of saw what happened. I mean, that was a devastating injury. I hope he comes back, but that's kind of the risk that you take with a young quarterback. Um, and, you know, the Eagles don't seem to be right now any better equipped to protect their quarterback than the Cincinnati Bengals are protected Joe Burrow. I mean, we know the kind of pressure that Hurts is going to be under on Sunday because, hey, the Saints, they can really bring it, boy. I mean, we know what Cam Jordan can do. Uh, this kid, Trey Hendrickson, is really coming on. Um, and they're not afraid. Dennis Allen is not afraid to blitz uh, from in any situation from any angle. So, you know, Jalen's going to be under the under fire all day. And, and it's going to be – I mean, he's going to have some moments that are going to be pretty ugly. I'm sure of that. Um, the question is, how's he – you know, how's he handle it? It seems to me based on – what we've seen of him as a college player, um, the highs, the lows. He seems to handle everything pretty well. Um, could he Could he possibly, could this short circuit his long-term development? It could, but I think he seems to me to be, to be wired in a way that I think he's capable of dealing with it better than most. Ray, we can't let you go without asking you about Carson Wentz because it's still the biggest story here because they have this guy under contract. Um, I guess they could try to trade him. Uh, that's kind of been thrown around this week, but it's not easy to do that. What do you think happens here? Is he the opening day starter next year? Can he recover from all this? That really is the $123 million question, isn't it? Um, I, 
if if you ask me right now, um, I would expect him. I, I I would expect him to be back next year. I, I just think that it would be very very hard to move him. You certainly you certainly aren't going to cut him. Uh, so the only option would be to try to find a partner to move him, and I just think that's going to be very hard to do. Um, so yeah, I think he's going to be I think he's going to be on the roster next year and. You know, I, I just kind of think, and I think Ruben even wrote this uh, wrote this this week, looking down the road uh, about the decision that was made and why you made it. And I, I agree. I think, barring an injury, I don't think you should take another snap the rest of the year. I think you just, I think you just, you just shut them down and you let Hertz play the rest of the way. Because uh, number one, you kind of, you kind of want to find out all you can about Hertz now. So why not? Let's let's let him play it out. And I think that for Wentz to just step away and just kind of observe for a while and watch. I mean, sometimes the idea, you know, we use the term clear your head. Um, I think there's a lot of truth to that, especially at this position. I've seen it work with some guys. Uh, and I think he, I think he really needs that. I, I think he really needs that. And I still, I still believe in his ability. I've seen him play too well too often to think that, oh, that was just a fluke or that was just an illusion. That's not really who he is. Um, I think that guy still exists. We just have to go find him, you know, and I, I think that maybe with some time in this off season, Lord knows he won't be lacking for motivation because he's got a lot to prove right now. Uh, I would fully, I fully expect him to be on this roster and come back next year. And when they line up on opening day, I think he's going to be your quarterback again. I really do believe that. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a strange thing. It's really making – I'll be honest, this is the first time I've ever really, like, questioned my eyes because I'm like, I've watched this guy, you see the talent, and then for it to kind of evaporate like this, it's shocking to me. What do you think – If so say the season ends and we'll see what happens with the head coach and GM and all that stuff, but if you're Carson Wentz and the season ends, what do you do? I mean, what do you do on your own because you're not going to be back in the building until – what, May for OTAs? Mm -hmm. What do you do from January to May to try to get yourself right? I would do um, – there, there are a lot of these uh, quarterback gurus that are out there. There are a lot of these quarterback camps that are out there. Um, there are a lot of quarterback coaches, um, individual personal coaches that would be worth spending some time with. Um, I, think he could, I think he could learn a lot just by going back. And I know he said he's done it. Uh, but go back and look at the film of himself from 2016 and especially 2017. Uh, physically, is he, he may not even be the same guy right now. I mean, he, I, it looks to me like he doesn't have that same kind of quick twitch ability in the pocket that he had then. It might just be a result of the injuries. I don't know. But I still think there's enough there that he can be um, a high-level player in this league. I, I really do believe that. The, but the bigger problem is – and I think Jason Kelsey kind of laid it all on the table yesterday. This is really an organizational issue. I mean, you know, a team doesn't collapse the way this team collapsed because of one player. I mean, when there's this level of failure, I mean, it goes all the way through the organization. Uh, and the best thing the Eagles could do for Carson Wentz is put a better team around him, you know, rebuild the offensive line, give him an offensive line he can trust, give him receivers he can work with. Uh, and I guarantee you he'll be a better player next year. I mean, some of it he has to do internally. Some of it he has to do in this offseason, just getting himself mentally and physically back to the player or close to the player that he was. But the rest of it is going to be on the team to put better players on the field with him. Given that opportunity, I still believe that he can be Carson Wentz again. I really do. Here's why I don't think the notion of a quarterback guru or quarterback coach is going to help him, because I – I see his problems not being mechanical or physical. I mean, his footwork is fine. I think his throwing motion is fine. He's not going sidearm or anything. It's up here. You know, it's, it's sensing pressure. It's timing. Um, it's, it's, you know, just the sense, the pocket awareness. I don't know how you improve that in a, you know, in a high school field with a, with a personal coach. Maybe you can, uh, but it seems to me that the things he's, he's struggling with are, are the mental side, you know, and, and that's never been a problem for him. He's always seen the field so well and uh, going through his progressions quickly. Um, that's the thing that concerns me is that I think physically he's fine. Now maybe there is collateral damage from all the injuries. Uh, it, it's certainly possible. There's no way to know. Um, but my biggest concern is his mental acuity and just his ability to, 
you know, make split second decisions on the field under pressure, which he's always been able to do so well. He just can't do now. I don't know how you fix that. Yeah, um, I think it, I, I agree with you. I, I think it is more mental than it is physical. Um, but uh, I, again, I come back to the idea that even though given every opportunity and all of his press availabilities, you know, he always says, look, I have confidence in my guys. I have confidence in my line. I, I work with my receivers. And what We don't have, that's not, he, I mean, he's saying what he feels like he has to say at the moment. I don't think he has any confidence in his offensive line, nor should he, given the way they've played this year. And when he has the ball in his hand, that affects everything. Uh, and you see, if you go back, and to me, the biggest difference between 2017 and now, when I look at it, is in 2017, their offensive line was so good. I mean, they were really good. And he knew it. And he knew every time, no matter what the play was called, whether it was him on the move or him in the pocket, he had full confidence that he was going to be, have the time to do whatever he wanted to do. I mean, he was going to have the time to go through his progressions. He wasn't going to be rushed. If he was, he'd have time to see it and react. Um, he doesn't have any of that now. Uh, and that's what's made him, when he has mechanical issues, I agree with you. I don't think that, I, I don't think he's forgotten how to throw. He knows it, but so many times he's thro throwing off balance. He's not stepping into throws. Um, his, his footwork is all over the place. And it's not because he doesn't know how to do it. It's because he's just not confident in his ability to function within the offense the way it is now. And he also, a lot of the time when they say, well, he's holding the ball too long, he's holding the ball too long. In, in the NFL now, the really good quarterbacks, the really good ones function purely on anticipation where a receiver's going to be, and you're throwing the ball before the guy even makes his break. I mean, boy, I mean, we saw the perfect example of it Sunday between Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. I mean, you're, you're never going to see much better chemistry between those two guys, and that ball's out of Rodgers' hand even before Adams turns because he knows where he's going to be, and that's why he's so hard to sack. He has a quick release, yes, but the reason, part of the reason he has a quick release is because he fully trusts his receivers, all of them, but Adams especially. You know, Carson doesn't have that with any of his guys right now. You sort of seem to be building towards that with Fulgham, but now Fulgham's never on the field, it seems like. So I, I, think it, I think it all kind of ties into everything that's happening around him. I think those abilities still exist within him. He just needs to be put in a better situation where he has guys around him that uh, can complement him and, you know, give him the kind of trust and the confidence that he had in 2017 when, let's face it, he was the best quarterback in the league for two-thirds of the season. Should we even ask you for a prediction on Sunday, Ray? Oh, sure. <laughs> He's, going to He's going to Eagles, I think. You're going to Eagles, right? <laughs> no, I, no. I had a hunch you were going to go Eagles. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, Saints are really – the Saints are really – they got it going right now. I mean, defensively, they're really good. Uh, and even with Taysom Hill um, – I mean, he's just getting better. I mean, last week he actually looked like a real quarterback out there against Atlanta. So, you know, I don't think, um, you know, I, I don't think that the Saints are going to run up a lot of points. I think they're, they're, they know that the Eagles aren't going to be able to score very much given the rookie quarterback and given the way their defense is playing. Uh, I think they feel pretty confident that they're going to keep the Eagles score down. So I don't think that, I don't think Sean Payton's going to come in here and open up the playbook and try and score a ton of points. I think this is one that they'll just come in and, try and play a clean game and score enough that they can win it. I'm, I think if, if I were to pick a score, I'd probably be somewhere like 24 to 14. I think that'd probably be, be right about there. But the Saints are, you know, the Saints are really good, guys. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think that when Malcolm Jenkins made the decision he made to leave Philadelphia and go to New Orleans, I mean, partly it was, yeah, he was unhappy with the front office and he felt like, you know, they, they felt they, they could have shown him a little more respect. But I think ultimately what it came down to was at this point in his career, he wanted to go somewhere where he felt the team had the better chance to win. And he wanted to have it go to a team that he thought had a better chance to maybe win a Super Bowl. And he looked at the Philadelphia situation, looked at New Orleans, and he said, you know, I think I have a better chance to win in New Orleans. And I, and it's right. He's helped that team. And right now they're the best team in the NFC and they're probably going to get to a Super Bowl barring an injury. I mean, to have won three in a row and stay on course, even without Drew Brees, is an indication that the, you know, this isn't just a one man operation. They've got a, a really good team in all three phases and certainly going to be the better team on the field on Sunday. All right, Ray, we appreciate your time and we'll talk to you next week. All right. I look forward to it guys. Have a great week. See you Sunday. Good Take stuff. care guys. Bye bye. Thanks. If you're a football fan, you need to check out the new game Sunday night seven on the NBC sports predictor app. 
There's really no reason not to play. It's totally free, and it's got $2 million in guaranteed cash prizes this season with $100,000 up for grabs every week. All you have to do is make seven predictions about what will happen on Sunday Night Football for your chance to win some serious money. Uh, download the NBC Sports Predictor app or head to NBCSports.com slash predictor to make your Sunday Night 7 picks. Thanks, as always, to Ray Didinger. Malcolm Jenkins coming back to town on Sunday. He spoke in New Orleans on Wednesday. Let me just read you real quick what he said. For me, I gave everything I had to that city, to that team, did everything the coaches asked me to do, did everything to make the players around me better, tried to put my best football out there, and it just wasn't valued that much by those who make the decisions. For me, it was just more of a principle of about respect. I didn't really care about what the money was, but I wanted to see what that respect factor was, and it wasn't valued at what I thought. When he talks about the front office, he's talking about Howie Roseman, and it's kind of a shame for Malcolm Jenkins, an all-time eagle, to have left here feeling undervalued and disrespected. Yeah, and we, we, I mean, gosh, we talked about this throughout the offseason. We, we kind of didn't think it was about money. Yeah, we did at first, of course, when we saw the contract with the Saints, we didn't. But it, it, it was. It was about respect. And uh, he's still a good player. And I, I think this was just another, just another gaffe by Howie. I mean, I, I didn't get it then. I don't get it now. He's not the player he was maybe three years ago, but he's still really, really good. He's still better than Jalen. Mills, and he should be an eagle. He should have finished his career here. And um, sometimes I just don't know where how he's coming from. I, you know, I you want to you want to do a youth movement, and you get rid of a thirty year old, thirty one year old Malcolm Jenkins, and then build around Alshon and Jason Peters. It just doesn't make sense. What kind of youth movement is that? Where you get? I mean, Mal, Malcolm's not an old player. You know, he's he's at the, in the twilight of his career i guess but he's still a really good player we saw that last year he wasn't bad last year uh, it just didn't make sense uh, you know i i know there's a theory out there that that um you know they wanted carson to be the leader and you know malcolm as long as malcolm was here carson couldn't be the leader uh if that if that was genuinely the reason they got rid of him then that's even worse because you know, first of all, that's not how you build a roster to try to build up your quarterback's confidence and not, you know, not artificially make him the unquestioned leader of the locker room because that's not going to work. Um, but, you know, you hurt the product on the field, too. Um, it was just a, another in a series of colossal misjudgments by Howie Roseman. Yeah. And you and you brought up a good point about Peters and and Alshon. They made all these other exceptions to the youth movement. I mean, and we can add Vinny Curry in there. We both like a lot, but he's 32 years old. Deshaun so, even. You know. Deshaun, yeah. So they made all these other exceptions, and they didn't make an exception for Malcolm Jenkins, who granted would well, have I been – play. <laughs> yeah, who can still play. Granted, it would have been more expensive. Um, but it, it seemed like they made up their minds. I mean, they, they weren't going to bring Malcolm back. At, he wanted the raise, and they weren't going to bring him back on his old contract. You know, so it was – that those two – it was never going to work. I mean, I think they tried to have conversations out of respect, but he was never going to be back here. And on some level, I understand it because it's a significant investment, even though it's less than what we thought it was going to be for an aging veteran. The bigger problem I have is how they tried to replace him. I mean, their solution to replacing the most versatile, one of the best and the biggest leader on the team was, hey, let's slide that cornerback who's not good at cornerback to safety, let's sign a guy who we never play and let's draft a kid in the fourth round. Like that was their solution to replacing an all-time great, and that wasn't good enough. Uh, and and they also lost a ton of intangible stuff with Malcolm too. But yeah, it it's kind of strange, and it, it, it honestly it just sucks that he feels that way. Um, yeah, and it, you hate to see that because he, he really is like. Um, you can make the argument that Nick Foles is the greatest free agent acquisition in franchise history. I get that. Um, but it's kind of a, Nick Foles messes everything up when you talk about uh, all time stuff. Um, but really for me, it's either Malcolm or Troy Vincent. 
the two greatest free agent acquisitions in Eagles history. Brandon Brooks is on the short list, but you can really make a case that Malcolm is the greatest free agent acquisition in team history. And he's really one of the all time great players. Yeah. And when you look at Reggie and you look at doc and you look at Malcolm, I mean, they're three of the best defensive players in Eagles history. I mean, Reggie and doc are one and two and Malcolm's in the top 10. Um, and they all left under, I mean, different people, you know, Brain was Reggie, Joe Banner's Doc, and, and Howie was, was Malcolm. But um, it's just sad that three of the all-time greats have left under, you know, under less than ideal circumstances. And all three could still play. I mean, Reggie had incredible years with the Packers, won a Super Bowl. Doc was still a good player. I think he made three Pro Bowls with the Broncos. And... You know, obviously, Malcolm is still playing at a high level. You see, you know, where their defense is compared to where the Eagles' defense is. And uh, it just seems like a no-brainer. And it's just, uh, it's just a shame that this franchise has this record of – and I don't, put, I don't put Malcolm quite in the Doc and Reggie category, but he's, he's pretty close. I mean, he was – you know, what did he make, three Pro Bowls here? Yeah, and, and when you factor in the leadership – yeah. Of it too. I mean, that's there's no way to quantify that, but it, it meant a lot to this team. Oh yeah, I mean, the team just gra- guys gravitated to him. He was he was a um, he was such a powerful voice in that locker room. I mean, gosh, and and I don't know, maybe they thought it was it was he was too powerful. You know? And I think there's maybe a little bit of credence to that. Um, yeah, but anyway, it'll be good to see him play on Sunday. It'll be interesting to see if two other old guys are playing on Sunday, Jason Peters and Alshon Jeffrey. Kind of a weird thing yeah. in Doug's Wednesday press conference, which has really become – I shouldn't say it's not normal anymore. That, that's the norm. That's the new norm he was talking about is weird stuff in press conferences. But uh, he kind of hinted that Peters and Alshon might not play on Sunday. He said they're both sore – and then they both popped up on the injury report. But, I mean, they've been sore. I mean, they're old guys. It, it seems convenient, to put it lightly. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that this is happening when Jalen Hurts is starting. I, I think I think organization, they're probably thinking, you know what? We're three, eight, and one. The Giants in Washington are starting to win some games. We're not winning this division. We don't even want to try to win this division. Uh, not that Alshon and Jason Peters were helping that, but <laughs> I think there's an organization wide finally understanding, and and they do seem to do this every year. Where they're like, oh, let's play some young guys because you know it's the end of the year. But uh, I, I think obviously Alshon and, and Jason Peters are both out there embarrassing themselves and tarnishing their legacies, and. Um, they're not – if they don't play, it's not because they're hurt. It's because it's just time to shut them down. They're not helping. Um, maybe they just don't – Doug doesn't want to say that. He doesn't want to embarrass them. You know, he certainly Which don't want is to, fine. I mean, I get that. But do whatever you have to do. Yeah. I mean, Alshon was a Super Bowl hero. JP is the best offensive lineman in Eagles history. So you don't want to embarrass them. But they're embarrassing themselves and a the franchise when they play. So it's the right thing to do. And, and hopefully we don't see them play in an Eagles uniform ever again. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. I, it, it sounds harsh, but it's, yeah, you don't want to see them play again. You just can't. Yeah. And I wrote a piece for, for the site today about JP in particular and just how he's tarnished his legacy. And, and it's sad to see um, a guy who, because I think if you ask a hundred Eagles fans right now, 98 of them will tell you, you know, I don't ever want to see that guy again. And the guy's an all-time Eagles great. And it's a shame that he's got to go out this way. Um, I think in time, you know, his, his, legacy, his legacy will be restored. I think time heals. Uh, but right now, I mean, you know, people want to run him out of town. And these guys a nine-time Pro Bowler, seven-time Pro Bowler here. I mean, Reggie, Dawk, and JP all made seven Pro Bowls. The only guy to make more was Chuck Bednarik for crying out loud. And I know Pro Bowls aren't the, you know, always the best way to gauge these things. But just for context, I mean, he's an all, he's one of the greatest Eagles of all time, and he's become a laughing stock. And it's hard to see. And the more he plays, the more he tarnishes his legacy. And it's going to take some time to 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 change that. But it's got to start now. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And hopefully it does. We'll see on Sunday. If you enjoyed the Eagle Eye podcast, do us a favor. Please rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate that. And we say it, I'm going to say until the end of the year, we appreciate seeing uh, us show up on your guys' Spotify year end playlist. That's pretty cool. Uh, thank you to Ray Dittinger for joining us, as he does every Thursday. Everyone, enjoy your weekends. For Rube, I'm Dave. This has been Eagle Eye presented by Nissan. We'll talk to you guys soon.